Good evening, um, Rudy El Khoury, Dean of the School of Architecture. Happy to welcome you all to our last current lecture this term. The current lecture series is a forum for the diversity of voices and interests in an expanded professional field and for a broader audience. For this current series, we also partner with the AIA Miami in offering 1.5 CEUs for attending the lecture. And is the, is the sign-up sheet here? In the, yeah, okay. Uh, our guest speaker tonight is Ted Gibbons, who is also a visiting professor this term at the School of Architecture, leading a studio with a real-world project set in the Bahamas. Ted is a founding design partner of the Hong Kong-based architecture firm Ten Design. This firm was started in 2010 with about eight employees and has grown to almost 200 people with offices in Hong Kong, Dubai, the UK, and now in Miami under Ted's leadership. Ted's team has won over 30 design competitions in Asia and numerous awards, most recently a 2017 Cityscape Dubai Residential Futures Award. Ted has had articles and projects published in the South China Morning Post, Evolo Magazine, Mark, the Boston Globe, and AD. His work has also been featured on ABC's Right This Minute, Bloomberg, The Weather Channel, and in Arte TV documentary titled L'Architecture Climatique. Research, design, innovation, and interdisciplinary collaborations are key driver behind his work with projects ranging from a building envelope that purifies the air a tornado-proof suburb design and a sustainable housing project in rural Philippines now under construction. Please join me in welcoming Ted Gibbons. Hey guys. So I think I'll just go through some of the work of the firm because I guess we're much better known in Asia and we're just starting the office here in Miami officially in January. So this is our Hong Kong office. I think at the picture there are 60, maybe 60, 70 people. And now we have two floors and about 150 people in Hong Kong. Um, actually last, last year we opened, or this year we opened our office in Edinburgh, Scotland. It was about 10 people, now it's about 50. And the plan is this year to open the Miami office. And this is a cool office, it's in an old theater. So it's right in the heart of Edinburgh and downtown so it's a kind of really kind of vibrant, interesting scene. And this needs to be updated, but this is mainly where our work is. I mean, most of the dots are in Asia, uh, Malaysia, Singapore, um, Doha, Dubai, a lot in Turkey, and now mo much more projects in Europe. There's also an airport in Ivory Coast and a couple jobs in the US now. But we started in Hong Kong. We're based in Hong Kong, and we're, we're kind of doing the opposite of most firms. We're going kind of back to the West. And just to go through some of the, the current projects, this is a water park in China. It's a competition. And we're just given the next stage of the project. And for example, this piece here, the volcanic bay in Orlando can fit inside this building, the whole project. So it's six of those. And the client wants to build 25 of these parks in China. So this is the first prototype. And it's in Harbin, which is a very, very cold city where the, the river freezes. And they want the buildings to be 90% open in the summer and then close in the winter. So a lot of the study was just looking at the percentage of openings on the roof and how to do the structure. And I guess, like, like Rudy said, our firm started in 2010. And we were bought by Aegis about a year ago, which is a big French engineering company. And one of their specialties is stadiums. So they have about 14,000 engineers. So all of these projects, we can engineer and design. So it gives us a lot more freedom as designers now. But most of this study was about opening the roofs and opening the walls. The chairman wanted it as open as possible. 
And then a lot of these are just our process. We start with kind of these kind of wild sketches, different ideas, and start to model them, go through them, show them to the client, get feedback. And this was before it was more of an enclosed kind of space. It was this coral reef inspired structure. But then the client kind of changed the reef and told us it has to all be operable. Which it's an extremely, extremely cold climate, so it's gonna be very, very difficult to achieve. So these are a few of the study models of some of the, of the different pavilions. And this is one at night, it's just a collection of these bubbles and they wanted these really kind of sci-fi space-like derived forms and just something kind of otherworldly. So we're playing with lighting and the shapes and reflectivity to make something kind of transformative as you come into this environment. And I think for the first phase of this, we had about three weeks and then we presented it to the chairman. And if you make the cut, you get three more weeks. You make the cut, you get three more weeks. And then it took about three weeks and they've given us the next stage of work, which goes into SD. But just a lot of kind of varied shapes and looking at some of these armatures that come off the forms that allow the roofs to slide off and, and hold the structure. So it's, a lot of it's based on how the structure works and how to get daylight in and keep the snow out. And then this is one in Dubai. We do a lot of work in Dubai. The client came and said, we have a 50 meter sculpture. There's no brief. And what, what would you guys do? And we were also designing the Cirque du Soleil around this tower. So this was based on a hypostyle hall, like in, in ancient Egypt. And the idea is the center of this piece is reflective. So when you stand inside the sculpture, you have an infinite kind of colonnade out of this kind of singular sculpture. But they ended up picking this one, which when you stand in the bottom of the sculpture and you look up, you see reflections of all the city of Dubai. So it makes almost this tapestry or quilt and puts all this, um, the kind of expanding city into one piece. So when you stand on the bottom, you see all of Dubai. And then the chairman picked it because he thought it'd be the, it'd be the world's biggest selfie stick. So he didn't quite get the kaleidoscope or the patrick, but he thought it'd be a, a gigantic selling point as a selfie stick. And this is another one for the same client as a water park. They gave us another project for a 32 story parking garage. So this is a robotic parking garage for 600 cars. And this is also a prototype for China. So it's the idea of a simple modernist building. They want it all glass. But the idea is to put a ripple in it, almost a ghost in the machine, highlighting some of the technology and the power inside this building. And you can't quite see, but there's algae tubes all down the side. So these are going to be used to help purify the air as well. So it, it does more than just park cars. It's also cleaning the air. And there'll be a small restaurant in the base. And this is another study as well, more of um, just pinching, a simple move, and making gardens up the project. And once again, this is a prototype, and they're going to deploy these all over China. So there are about 30 different versions of this. And then this is just, I guess one student said about my history a little bit. So I guess my first review in architecture school, my professor told me I was a black sheep and I'd always be the black sheep of architecture. But he said that was good. And I just got hammered in every single review, like just attacked and obliterated every time I presented, all the way through grad school actually. But ironically, that's what got me all of my jobs. So I'm kind of proud of that. Like my first job, I was just watering the grass at a garden center. And the guy saw me and stopped his car and I thought he was just gonna like, teach me some more, but he offered me a job. So kind of by doing everything wrong, it kind of worked out right. Like some of my friends did all the right moves, I did all the wrong moves, and it, it, kind, of, it kind of evened out in the end. And my, actually my second job after grad school, I got in the grocery store, because the guy packing my groceries was working in the grocery store because he couldn't make enough money as an architect. And he looked down at me, he's this huge guy, I said, I know you, and it kind of freaked me out. And he's like, I see you at the lunch truck. I was like, oh, all right. So he, he gave me his job at his old firm. He was leaving to go to grad school. So the first two jobs were completely just random. And a lot of times because people would come to my reviews just to watch the slaughter, essentially. And then my, I guess, first real job was at Freelon. It's an African-American firm in North Carolina. And it was a really neat firm. And they let us do a lot of design. So for this one, did all the kind of the skins, the patterns, and the basic masking of the building. It's an education building at NCANT. And currently our firm is doing a project across the street from this building with, with Freeline, or a, a spin-off firm of Freeline. Also did a, a biomanufacturing building, and it was based on the DNA helix and nucleotide sequence. So it's this, these window patterns based on DNA and held together by the structure of the DNA and this canopy. And it formed a gateway to campus. There's a very, very low budget. So we went brick and corrugated metal and minimized the glass. But just some of the early projects that were done in the States. I mean, kind of very modern, but trying to play with them as much as we could. And a bit of a rougher image of an African-American cultural center. I think it's my first competition. And we won this in Charlotte, North Carolina. And it was based on the idea of the quilts that are draped over kind of slave houses. They would give messages about how to get to the Underground Railroad and how to escape. 
So the whole building was a, a quilt depicting Jacob's ladder and a message of hope. And then I went to Little. This is maybe when I was about 32. And they made me a design director, which maybe was a mistake, but just threw me right off the edge. And we designed a new university housing complex. And the idea was to minimize circulation and stack all of the units. So they were minimize circulation, also to kind of express where you're living. So we won the competition, then lost it, then finalized, finalized the international competition. And then a local school in Mount Olive built the project. So the projects all take an interesting course. And at the same firm, we did a competition in China, just some of the sketches for this um, convention center. There are 10 firms who actually won the competition by a fluke. And the firm was going to make me a partner, but they didn't want to work in China. They actually said, F China. If the US economy is taking a dip, we want to strengthen our US branches. And I told them, thank you, but I'm going to go to China, because I think that's where the future is at this moment in time. And I just wanted to explore China. So some friends from an old firm said, you should go to RMJM in China. So that's what I did. And at the same time, we were doing a lot of competitions on the side. And this is Evolo, I think, at second place in 2008. But the firm encouraged us to do lots and lots of competitions. So a friend and I, Rugel, we won so many competitions, we were ranked as a firm based on competition wins. So we just got really bored and started doing lots and lots of competitions. And at one point, we were so out of ideas, we actually ran out of time and just built our French fries for one of the entries and got, a fi got finalists. So we were just trying to take as many ridiculous ideas as we could and concepts and try to combine them. And we found that the more ridiculous we got, it always rationalized and became a scheme. So this was one for Singapore, which is a tower that collected and purified its own water and even had a place to kind of dry your clothes. So from there, I went to Asia, worked for RMJM. It's a big Scottish firm. I think there are 2,000 people. I think there are about 50 people left. It had some hard times. But when I first started, at the interview, there were, I think, 300 people in Hong Kong. And the day I started, there were 130 people. And my boss said, if we don't win this competition, we're going to go broke. So we won a competition here for this a fitness center, uh, Bohai Bank, a master plan, and five or six more competitions. So we'd just gotten Hong Kong. And the firm that I thought was stable was actually very unstable. But we, we had to literally win all these competitions, or there'd be no work. But it worked out, and it was great. And then I guess about two years in, the firm had some financial trouble. So the CEO told me, He's starting a new firm, why don't I join it? And that's how I started Tin. So there are about four of us in a laptop, and we started just producing projects, and it worked out pretty well. And this was actually the first competition at Tin. It was for a resort in Hainan Island. It's a series of off-grid kind of eco resorts, and there are slots through all the buildings, so they're all naturally cross-ventilated, and we're trying to get this building completely off-grid. There are some turbine systems, so it produced all its own power. But this building got into trouble because there was... 50,000 square meters of program, and the client proposed 100,000 square meters of program, and there's a bar street under the whole project, and the client was going to fill that in with dirt and hide it from the government and excavate it once the project was done. But the government quickly figured that out. And at the beginning, we were doing lots of houses. We did a bunch of villas in India and just playing with a lot of shading patterns and devices to shade the structures. So some of these are built now outside of Delhi. We use cast stone panels and used kind of really intricate patterns to create shading on the projects. Kind of very, very modern, but with a very kind of tactile, tactile language that fit with the local culture. And at the same time, we started doing some villas in Dubai, like very kind of thick, insulated buildings, but trying to make them as thin and delicate as possible, and just abstracting motifs from Arabian stallions and things onto these shading pat patterns. So as the light changed, it would kind of give vitality and interest to the house. But the firm really started doing villas. I think we did about six master plans in India, and started doing some villas in Dubai. And then our process, we do lots and lots of sketches. And then the basic idea is anybody that has an idea is free to sketch. We sit around the table, sketch together, and then we kind of morph those into the final solution. So this was one against, um, it was, I think, Zaha, Kingo Kuma, uh, Michael Hopkins, a bunch of guys. And we thought we had no chance, so we just went for it. And we won the competition, which was a library in Zuhai, uh, sorry, in um, Dali in China. And it got all the approvals, and then it got rejected at the last minute, so it's not going to get built. But recently, a, a child in Vienna was doing a school paper, and his mom is um, building a school. So he picked this as his favorite building in the world. So now it's going to be built as a version of a school in Vienna. So they always have an interesting story. 
And the main reason we won is we put half the program underground. We figured Zaha would do a kind of overblown giant project that they couldn't afford. So only one third of the building's above ground, the rest is buried, and it's divided so the program can be used at different times of day. So, so the main reason we won was because it's, it's kind of dynamic, but also because it can be built, it's more affordable, and it can be used at different times of day. So it's based on the idea of knowledge and a tree root, and you can kind of lie on this root and a symbol of knowledge. And it was all done in an anodized zinc skin. And then the, the bottom was a, a, a non-anodized copper, so it would patina over time. So part of the building would patina, part of the building would not patina. And it's actually quite large. It was about six, seven stories, and then three stories down into the ground. But this guy is getting a, a second lease on life in, in Vienna. This was also in Dalian. It was the new planning museum. We also won it and then lost it because they had no budget and they ended up just renovating an existing office building. But it was based on a, a blooming flower. And once again, we were playing with these titanium dioxide coatings. So as the wind passes over this building, it starts to purify and clean the air. So essentially, this coating is, is very cheap, easy to use. And they said in Hong Kong, if you put it on 50% of the buildings, it takes out 80% of the air pollution. So we're always trying to push the green envelope as much as we can. This is a museum we won in, in China. It's a library and a museum. It went on hold for about four years, but it's actually just starting construction. So it's a very, very, very low budget, and it's based on the kind of mountain landscape behind the, the project. So we cut a pathway through the building. It leads back up through this cut in the buildings to the mountains. And that's just a zoom in of the front entry. It's, just, it's all stone, all locally sourced stone, and then a lot of kind of backlit stone inside the building. And this front piece is galleries and classrooms. And then I guess back to the research. When we started the firm, we did a, a lot of research. So this was a building that was designed to be tornado proof. So the idea was it would respond to its direct location and not ignore kind of the climate or earthquake loads and things like that. So the first pass was this kind of trapezoidal, trapezoidal shape that was kind of made out of Kevlar. We'd done some research with Kevlar in the past. So you can do, you have the plywood panels, the SIPs that are plywood, insulation plywood. This was Kevlar insulation, sorry, yeah, Kevlar insulation Kevlar. So a very, very strong piece that would go in the ground on hydraulics to get out of the storms. And that actually morphed into more of a Miesian kind of simple glass box, 900 square feet that goes down into the ground. There's a concrete structure on the roof. So when this building is in the ground, you can land a school bus on it and nothing will happen. And it's also waterproof. The lip seals itself. So it's flood proof and storm proof. And when it's not stormy, it's a very glass building. You throw a rock, you can break it. So the idea was, not to make it look like a typical disaster proof building, but make it very, very light and delicate. And this hydro hydro hydraulic lift drops it into the ground, so it's completely um, wind, debris, and waterproof. And that's a section of how this starts to work. There's just kind of four hydraulic arms in the corner that slide this guy down into the ground, and it's completely impervious to any kind of weather. And some guys at Hong Kong U did some CFD analysis on the roof uploads of waterproofing, and a firm in Singapore engineered it. So it's actually, it's, it's all engineered now. And this is the specs on, it's a screw lift system. It ended up not being hydraulic. But we found some guys recently that I think will help us fund this and build this. There's this company that do a lot of kind of outrageous projects. And they, they create their own news. And they write stories about it. And they make money off the stories they generate off the projects. And that's a view from the top. It's all like laminated glass and a view from the side. We were, we were actually given a site in Utica, Kansas for a farmer that's had his kind of his barn destroyed twice and his pickup destroyed once. So when the pickup went, he called us and asked if we could put it on his site. And also, I worked in a lot of greenhouses when I was younger, so learning about hydroponics, and we were helping a homeless shelter in Hong Kong that grew mushrooms because the street walkers started growing mushrooms and selling them to companies to make um, kind of pasta sauces. So we're trying to develop an off-grid mushroom farm for the homeless community. They would use algae to make fertilizer and kind of a, a, a bioenergy to kind of run the air conditioning system for the mushrooms. So you have to have air conditioning to keep the temperature correct. So we're trying to do kind of a biofuel and also a, a fertilizing system off the algae. And this, this, we're still working with the algae, but it's, it's taking a lot longer to figure out the systems. And this was our first pass at the titanium dioxide coating. It was a housing tower. And the idea is we cook the whole thing in, in solar cells. It's a double skin, so the front, the back, and the glass wall behind the panels are all co coated in the nano coating. So the idea is it'll constantly clean the air, 
and it's activated by UV light, so our near UV light, a purple light. So the idea is the solar panels will power a UV light at night that will clean the air 24 hours a day. So you have this kind of purple tower that cleans the air constantly. So it's a symbol of cleaning the air. And then based on that one project, a developer in Malaysia hired us to do about six towers and a shopping mall. And he's coded all the buildings in the same coding. So these buildings are just completed in Kuala Lumpur. And they're lit at night. And they'll, they'll clean the air 24-7. And the government really enjoyed the story. And the developer got a lot more land. And it worked out very well for the developer. So he paid a little bit more and did something that as a positive kind of contribution to the environment. And it was really, really, really well received by the government. And there was also a lot of low-income housing in this site. And the buildings in the back are actually relocation housing. And when the developer gave it back to the owners, they made 50 times the original value of their unit. So it just was a really successful project in Malaysia. A very simple, low budget, but just something kind of interesting. And the center of the mall is a giant circle that's a fashion runway. So the whole mall is based on local fashion brands. That's just finished in Kale. And then th that developer probably gave us eight more jobs. And his goal is to build 100 towers in Kuala Lumpur. So he's also got a site that's right beside the Petronas Towers in downtown Kale. And we were tasked for designing about six resi towers, two relocation, and then kind of six ultra-poor housing and a hotel. So this is, this is kind of one typical project for us. It's like a master plan that becomes buildings. And the idea was he wanted to, I guess inspired by the Singapore Sands, to float a convention center across all the tops of the towers. And he's obsessed with fitness. So we got Nike to build a, a Nike store in the tower. And there's a ramp that comes down from the Nike store onto a kind of a, a sky jogging court, which will be this. So on the 67th floor, there's a running track that goes around the whole project and the convention center above. And he also loves green technology, so he's going to build an off-grid house on top of the tower. So he wants to build like the most advanced technological house on top of this tower in the middle of Kale. And he thinks that'll get people up to kind of see this and have weddings and things. So it's about this idea of fitness, this kind of cloud city, and then just pushing the limits of technology. And the skin is based off some, some, I guess, Malaysian stitching patterns. So trying to tie it back to the culture of the city. And at the same time, the relocation housing has the same feature. There's an outdoor indoor fitness center that floats across the two relocation housing. And relocation is because there's a small village that's been replaced. And then they'll each get units in this tower as a, as a payback for giving up their houses. But the developers got a really, really good track record of keep taking care of the people. So that, that did a really good job with the government. And then we also do resorts. This was one in, outside of Shenzhen, China. It's a long, linear master plan. And we proposed a gateway tower at the, at the middle. So as you go by, there's this sky gate. It's all cut out of the tower, and it's clad in bronze. So when the light hits it, at sunset, it'll glow. So you have a kind of a glowing sky bridge that is the gateway into this community. And it's, the client also designed a series of marshlands. We, we did towers instead of low-rise buildings to preserve the existing marshlands. We're just trying to show you a variety of some of the projects. And then this was one in Doha. I can't mention the client's name, but one of the brothers used to be married to Janet Jackson. And he actually wasn't allowed to build a villa because he was too Western. But essentially, the client bought 12 Arabian stallions, and he built a ranch to support the 12 stallions. And every, um, every summer, it gets too hot, so he ships the stallions to the UK. So he sends them on an air-conditioned jet to the UK every summer. So essentially, it was his personal home up in the, in the top corner. It was the, the stallion center. There's a falconry. There's an aviary. There's 150 cows, 200 sheep, 80 geese, the workers' housing, uh, two organic farms, greenhouses, a palm orchard that's existing, and then a peacock barn so he can release peacocks when he has parties, a mosque, and an underground soccer stadium and video game center and theater for his sons. So this is kind of the breakdown of all the pieces. I think the Peacock Barn is the most interesting, but this is just because he decided to buy 12 horses. So then it became his kind of country ranch. And he bought 77 acres that's on an existing oasis. So it's going to be a very, very green, lush place. And that's a view looking across. Uh, uh, kind of, there's a natural spring on the site. And that's the kids' underground playground in the back. So it's an underground soccer field, theater, and video game center for the kids. And then also in, um, in Dubai, it's not Doha, but Dubai, it's a center for the Emirati because the government was worried that all the new buildings are being built for foreigners and for tourists. So they wanted an Emirati spa or kind of health center. So it's an existing place where they grow oats for the horses. And we took all the buildings and clustered them in the center around a, a pool and restaurant. 
And there's a lady spa, a men's spa, a health center, conference center, a marketplace, a series of F&B restaurants, and then down in the corner, an action zone for the kids. So the idea is to cluster it all in the center because it gets very, very hot in the summer. So you can walk between all the different pieces very easily, and they all open out. So the idea is really to wrap the garden around the buildings. So there's, it feels like it's in a lush landscape, but it's very convenient to get around in the center on hot days. So that was the basic idea. Each piece has its own courtyard. The main thing is the men and women's zones are very separate. But then also all these pieces are organized so that wind blowing from the north and the south ventilate the building. So it's all designed with CFD so that every, every alleyway, every piece is designed for natural ventilation. And this is the idea of clustering everything in the middle so it's very easy to access the different pieces from one central courtyard. And this was the idea of, of in, the, in the evening, we blow across the main lake and it goes through all the spaces. So all the arms, all the legs are designed so the air blows through. And even the main water feature is off to the north so it'll catch the evening breeze and blow it through the health center. And then this is just an image of the central floating restaurant. There's a sunken courtyard in the pool and then it sits in the fountain and the roofs are lifted up to allow cross ventilation of breezes through the building. This was a university we did in uh, Fujian, China. It was for a Taiwanese shipping company, and his family was from this kind of this area, so he wanted to build a university for kind of LED and photonic technology. So this whole building was designed around the idea of preserving nature. There's a ring in the middle of the site. It's where three streams come together. So that is inside the ring, n nothing kind of touches the streams. The streams are all preserved. And we tried to kind of stitch the buildings into the landscape. So there's a series of plazas, landscape, plazas, landscape. And on this one, you're up against Foster and Renzo Piano. And we, I don't know, we should not have won, but we did. And then we ended up giving the front library to Foster in the front of the building. But it's a kind of an interesting project for a shipbuilding company. And they've been building a lot of projects using their shipbuilding technology. But unfortunately, they're all in jail now because they're actually embezzling money with this project, turned out. That's a view of how we start to stitch these buildings into the landscape. It's kind of true. All our best clients end up, end up in jail, typically. But they're, they're a very good client unfortunately, in jail now. But the son actually might be here because he jumped bail and he's from Florida. So I think he might be around. So technically there's no extradition, so he might be our client again. But really, really nice clients. But then also the same idea of maximizing outdoor spaces, pulling, this is cafeteria, pulling the roof off, ventilating the spaces, putting courtyards, and just trying to maximize outdoor spaces and reduce the, the heating load and the cooling load on these buildings. And this, actually, this, most of these buildings are built now, but the problem is they got maybe 85, 90% built, and it's all full stop now. And this is one of the academic buildings. It was actually very, very low budget, but we used local stone. We used a kind of a deep double skin to provide shading. And it's, um, it had different kind of stone patterns create these kind of reflectivities in the skin, but just doing the most we could with a very, very tight budget. And then this was a dormitory that had even lower budget, so just using color and patterning to try to make something interesting out of, this, out of the space. And then speaking of schools, this is a school in China, and it's quite interesting. In China, education is a huge, huge investment. So the schools were given a lot of attention, a lot of focus. So this is a kindergarten, a middle school, and a community center, and also a regional bus hub, and a place where the middle school students live. So the students actually live on campus. I mean, this is just a bit how I sell a design. So the idea was to make a courtyard for each section. We reinforce that with the buildings. And the idea is that creates a kind of secure, um, safe environment for the kids. And then in each courtyard, we put a kind of special piece because there is a very low budget as well. But we can do something kind of more um, articulated, more interesting for the kids, almost like a sculpture in the garden. And then we based all of those around mathematical patterns. So there's Lorenz, Lorenz attractor, Fibonacci sequence, and then uh, another system that exposed kind of explains how things stain or how things grow, how patterns move across, like how, how paper burns, how coffee stains kind of migrate. So as the idea about knowledge and growth through mathematical formulas. And the idea is by embedding this in each project, the kids know there's a higher kind of formulation or a higher kind of power at work that describes what's there. It's not, it's not random, it looks very random, but it's actually based on these kind of solid foundations. And the school itself can become a learning tool. So that's one of the things, I think that's the reason the client picked us. But one of the original sketches of the middle school, so the cafeteria is this flower, and it breaks apart and forms an art, kind of art garden in the other corner. So these kind of really fractal shapes become these kind of flowers in the garden. And these two bars with an internalized landscape that's very safe, very secure, and isolated, because kind of 
the security of the kids is very important there as well. So they're almost designed as kind of fortresses, but also making these kind of beautiful bucolic gardens that the kids feel safe in. And that was a view from the competition of the main cafeteria and the bar kind of cantilevers off of the classroom. So very simple bars, but just inserting some very sculptural pieces. And this one's just finishing DD. It'll be under construction soon. And actually most of the things you see are actually under construction now. It's just we've been around maybe eight years now, so they're, they're just starting to get built. And at the end, I can show you a couple of the built projects. And that's the other end of the garden where the art center is. And there's an amphitheater in the middle. It's kind of buried under the ground. And this was the kindergarten. It was the idea of how the stains start to spread, having this kind of sculptural flower in the middle of the piece. And that's the music room and the art room. So it's just something that everything orients around, but it's almost like the traditional Chinese gardens. It has a sculptural, abstracted natural element in the middle of the garden. And just to show like detail, this is the competition level plan. So we work out all the spaces, all the areas. So there's a lot of work in these competitions. And they usually last maybe four weeks to six weeks. So this one, I think this one is done in six weeks. And it was maybe about maybe eight people as a team. And then this was the kindergarten with this kind of piece in the middle. And how the kids kind of relate to this piece. It starts to pull out and peel in and create these. It, it forms a covered garden. So if it's raining, you can play underneath this sculptural piece. And you can see the stain pattern on the ground and also coming up the side of the building. And this was the cultural center. So it was, it was um, some organic restaurants that have outdoor gardens and then a, a library and a little meeting center along the main street edge. So we've, we've probably done 20 jobs for this one client alone. And this was the same client that went to jail in Taiwan. It was uh, a water park, but also an uh, outdoor shopping area and hotel. So there's a budget hotel here to attract young people, and then uh, a higher-end hotel with a big window overlooking the water park. So it's a really neat site. It's this long, linear site, and we, we're in charge of this piece here. So it's just out, outdoor shopping, hotels, and this linear sequence to get people kind of through this space. And they're really proud they're going to put an IKEA on this back corner. IKEA, Kafka, and then all outdoor retail. But once again, a super, super client, very open-minded, just embezzling money, unfortunately. And then this was a competition in Chongqing, China. It's a third, third tier city, but a really interesting city. They have a lot of musical heritage, and it's where the mythical kind of Shangri-La is supposed to be located. So the client wanted something ultra simple, but also highlighted music, which is this intangible cultural heritage piece. So the idea was on the main hotel, we put a sky garden on top of the building. So there's an abstracted mountain that sits in this glass box. It's a lobby. It's also a series of restaurants. So at night, it'll appear that this piece is floating. So the skin gradates up. So as the building goes up, it gets darker. And there'll be this kind of floating garden in the sky. And there's a large, vibrant concert hall on the bottom that changes color based on the music. Because the, across the harbor, there's a series of little alcoves. And every day, people practice their instruments and play music. So it's got all these little outdoor spaces for people to play their music. So it's a really fantastic city. And the idea was to pull this riverfront walkway into the site and create this inner garden. You can see a bit of the performance center. And then there's all these little moments. It's hard to see in the master plan, but there are all these little moments where people can gather and mix in with shopping centers. So this is one of those pieces. It's a little coffee shop when you first come in. So the whole site starts to bloom with light at night. So it's, it's known for these flowers and these fantastic landscapes. So we're trying to make this really kind of otherworldly landscape once you're in this kind of simple rectangular language of the base buildings. And yeah, we started getting into bigger scale master plans. So this is one that's about two by two kilometers in Zhuhai, China. And it was in between a couple master plans that nobody had planned how to put them together. So the idea was it's mainly office buildings, uh, residential, a school, an incubator office. So our basic concept was to put a Chinese garden in the middle of the site, but there wasn't enough space for garden. So we actually made the incubator office into a mountain garden. And it's always trying to stitch in nature into our projects. And the government responds very well when we put a lot of kind of free 24-hour spaces for the public to enjoy. So we always, we always try to try to create as much public space as free to the public as possible. So there was a master plan to the north, one to the south. And the idea was we made these plazas. And actually, one plaza here was based on someone else's building. One of our competitors, we fight against Aedis quite a bit. So this was an, an Aedis tower. We made a forecourt for their building and actually pushed our building in off the main street so it wouldn't dominate these buildings to the south. And then we interwove these pedestrian pathways around our central garden. And each of the neighborhoods got its own garden. And the idea was this hub is an uh, incubator office. So you have these low-lying kind of retail and office buildings with all these terracing. 
and you kind of grow from these small buildings out into the bigger buildings. So it's almost like a protected incubated space, like an embryo, and you grow up into the taller towers. So that's kind of, it was really a bit raw, but that's how that started to work. It, it, the buildings all kind of mounded up and formed this entry corner, and then it all ended up in this kind of central mountain landscape. So it's an abstracted mountain garden on top of the buildings in the middle of the site. So this one's still in government approvals because it's, it's a big project. So this one's having a lot of kind of revisions and passes on trying to get it past the government. But they, the client actually tried to change it quite a bit, but the government made them, made them come back and follow our master plan exactly. So it's going in the right direction. And that was just an image of some of the taller towers as you approach the building. So a few organic towers have come down and fold into the gardens. So the buildings start to kind of root and uh, attach themselves to the gardens, but most of the buildings are kind of very simple, elegant boxes. And based on that project, we got invited to one in, um, in between Zhu Hai and Macau. There's a new city that's just coming out of the ground. It's, uh, it's Henting Island. And in the past maybe five years, they've probably built 100 towers. So we got another two by two kilometer piece and it was um, a free trade retail, housing, um, shopping mall. And in the bottom of this two by two kilometer plate, there was basement retail for the entire two by two kilometers. So there's two by two kilometers of basement retail under the whole project. It's just, it's just a mammoth, mammoth scale. It's just on a river, it's just on a mountain. So we connected those two together, the big central park, and started to bleed these gardens into the different spaces, creating neighborhoods and making g gateway towers. And once again, the client was really trying to simplify, but the government came back and they're, they're having to build these buildings exactly like the master plan. But this is really a kind of organic towers that have gardens that tear up the top. They kind of highlight the fact that it's kind of blurring the idea of landscape and nature together. And we also designed a few of the bridges out front as well. And actually, on this one, it's going quite smooth. And these first, these, these guys are under construction, this block. And then these first six towers are also all under construction. So it's, it's going incredibly fast. And then at the end of one of these corridors, we tried to have these simple buildings, but actually start to shift the plates and bring the gardens up the buildings. So the idea is the gardens kind of infuse themselves kind of through these green fingers and actually go up some cert go up certain buildings to create a more friendly green landscape. So it's, it's not as efficient, but it, it really kind of blurs the landscape and the buildings together. And then a, a competition stage doing kind of sections and things through to explain how the retail works. There's an underground freeway, there's a monorail system, just how the circulation works, how people go across the site, and trying to create this kind of centralized kind of presentation space and platform in the middle. There's a series of cooking schools and outdoor venues and concert halls right in the middle of the site that ties it all together. So just like the last master plan of the garden, this was a performance hub in the middle of the site, and the buildings on the edge kind of were very solid, and they pulled themselves up out of this piece. And we also do the landscape design, so we're kind of partitioning and, and laying out functions and programs for the entire garden. It's a giant, giant garden. So each piece has its own theme, its own age group to try to create this kind of vibrant hub. So it's not just the plazas, but the gardens themselves are active and, and full of kind of life and vitality. And we also do single buildings. This is a very simple building we did for the same client, Quafa. It was a competition. And it is a split system, which means there are outdoor units on each unit. It's office and residential. So the louvered pieces for the air conditioning units became the design move. So it became this linear piece and we pulled it off, had a separate piece and created a big outdoor space once again for the public in the middle of this project. So it's a place where young people can hang out. They have really small units, but we started giving these roof gardens and these big outdoor rooms. So they feel like they have a, a, a bigger piece and just a small unit. And this one's under construction as well. And then we do a lot of work in Korea now. This is a competition we actually lost for a courthouse. But through this competition, we met LG and we've won a competition for LG and we've done a shopping mall for LG because all of the big consumer companies in Korea, they also do development. So it's called GS, but we're doing two projects in Korea for, for GS at the moment. But it's a kind of very simple monumental courthouse scheme. But I think we lost because the planning was horrible inside. It was a really simple building and the planning was just horribly complicated. So it betrays a simplicity that doesn't exist in the planning, unfortunately. But it was a good exercise and it got us introduced into the Korean market quite, quite nicely. This was a bank in Chengda, China. It's also kind of a third tier city near, near um, Guangzhou, but it's actually the eighth richest bank in China. And they say everybody in this city, even the lady selling flowers is a millionaire. Cause it's really, really well known for trading and the property value is going through the roof. So it's one of the biggest banks in China. And the idea was once again, a, a fairly small budget. So we did a very simple boxy tower 
we stepped it at the top. And the idea is we have these bronze moyens that are anodized on aluminum. So during the day when the sun hits it, it'll constantly be changing. And as you go up the tower, there'll be kind of a halo effect as the moyens get deeper. So it'll have this orange kind of glow at the top of the tower just by kind of putting this curve and stepping the buildings back. So that was the original concept of this simple, elegant tower and then cutting the top and revealing this kind of metallic structure that will glow in the daylight and the sunlight. So it changes all during the day, but it's a very, very clean, simple tower. So in, in elevation, it's just very, very clean, slender tower. It's about 280 meters tall. So it's, it's a really, really simple tower, but it's got a play in the geometry. So during the sunlight, when you're experiencing the building, it'll have a quite dynamic effect. Or that's, that's, hopefully that's the case. It's under construction as well. The foundation's under construction. And this building to the side is where they have all their security systems. So this is the bank proper, and this is all the security. And then we do lots and lots of retail malls. That's, that was kind of, it was kind of housing, then retail, and now it's entertainment. And this was a shopping mall in Zhuhai, China, also competition. And it was really kind of trying to fuse, the, once again, the kind of the gardens, creating places, and mixing that with retail. So it's kind of half garden, half shopping experience. So it's just the idea of these, these ramps that, that come up and form courtyards, and just tucking the retail all under, under these spaces and just trying to create kind of a, as a natural environment as possible. But also having kind of sound retail circulation routes that will prop, like, populate all the stores. So this is one of the courtyards around some of the retail spaces. So just really playing a lot with nature and gardens and mixing that together with the buildings. And then I guess to conclude, this was one of our first built projects. It was actually started at RMJM, our former company, but finished by us. This is a convention center in Zhuhai. And we won this competition, I think, about 2009. And we've won another six towers and a shopping mall across the street. And we won another project on the other corner, which is, once again, shopping and residential. And we actually won the second phase of the convention center, which sits here. So we've got all four sites. And I think it's almost 20 buildings. And the building across the street is almost the same design, but out of stone. And the one across the corner is the same basic principle, but almost this roof piece here creating a ripple through the skin. So the whole building ripples up and forms this iconic kind of retail space. And then the one beside it is very simple, clean kind of resident towers and the addition to the convention center. And once again, this was, this was all designed in Katia and it was designed to get these natural breezes off the mountains and kind of through the building. And there's a big plaza here and a big plaza here. And it gets, it gets very, very hot in Zhuhai. So the idea is the, the flow will come off the mountains and blow through these spaces. And when it was first completed, the chairman was walking across that plaza and the wind blew his hat off, so it was a good sign that it had worked, luckily. And this was the tower. It's a St. Regis. We're doing another St. Regis now. It's about a 320-meter tower, so it's office below and hotel above. And there's also a Sheraton. There's a service apartment and a convention center here. And then this was, we do a lot of work in Chongqing, China. It's one of the four furnaces of China. It's a very, very hilly site. I think there's a 100-meter grade change across this site. We had won a competition for a single tower and a retail podium. And then the government liked it so much, they made all the other developers hire us. So we ended up doing about 16 towers. So they're all under construction now in Chongqing, China. So this, we generally have a good relationship with the government and the developers. So the government actually gave us essentially the whole CBD of this new part of Chongqing. This was one, I mean, there's so many different projects. This was an island in um, Dubai. It's residential. And you can see the structure of a uh, Ferris wheel behind us. It's not our Ferris wheel, but it's going to be the biggest Ferris wheel in the world. And then our buildings are all in front of this. It's a series of residential buildings on this man-made island in Dubai. And it is just getting the curtain wall onto the project. So like I said, a lot, a lot of the stuff is just getting built now. But there's, I think, about 40 jobs under construction now. So within a couple of years, there'll be a lot of built work. This was an oasis in Dubai. About... 35 years ago, the chairman started planting trees. There's a small aquifer and a series of a small oases. So he started planting more and more trees, knowing that he's going to develop projects. So he's created a giant tree farm. And it's actually dropped the temperature about 10, 10 degrees in this zone. So as he builds new buildings, he sells the trees to other developers and just kind of carves out the trees to make the buildings. So there's a series of villas, high-rise, and low-rise apartments. And the idea was he wanted an all-glass building, but it's extremely, extremely hot. So we use CFD again in some of these um, daylight softwares to create all these little platforms to come off the buildings. So it's a simple design, but like 
no real direct sunlight hits any of the glass members, and it creates a series of balconies. And the nice thing was this building sold out in one day. A lot of buildings having trouble selling, but it, 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 all the units were sold within a day. And that's the building under construction. It's a very long, linear building. It's, uh, it's the guy in the front of this rendering. And also some of the villas, I mean, the same kind of basic, very simple kind of boxy language, but also just finishing construction. But just a way to keep, actually, you can see, in this picture, you can see there is some light hitting facade, but <laughs> this is the villa, not the, not the big boy. And that's pretty much a, just a quick overview of our firm. And this, we also do bridges. This is a bridge we won in Zuhai as well. But just to give you guys a kind of a quick overview of what we do, and we're yeah, just kind of ramping up in the States. We have a master plan in North Carolina, and we have a 300-acre master plan in South Carolina, and they want to do a, a, a pine needle biodiesel plant. And we're talking to guys about a project in California and actually one in Miami. And the one in California, I think, is almost 1.5 million square meters. And the one in, uh, in Florida is about 500,000 square meters. So that's just a quick snapshot of what we do. It's, it's a lot of different stuff, and we don't try to have any kind of style, and it's very collaborative. I mean, I think it is. Maybe it's not, but we try to make it that way. That's, that's us. Yeah, sure. Any questions? Or, uh, let's go ahead. Hello. Um, first of all, thank you for the lecture. Um, it's clear that there's a capacity to do all sorts of projects in your office. So I'm curious to how you structure it, um, specifically in terms of research. Um, it seems like there's a lot of technologies that are being implemented to the designs. So I'm curious to know if you do that in-house. Um, and also a second question would be, so then do you do everything from conceptual to construction documents in-house as well? Um, well, the first question, I taught a few studios at Hong Kong U, so I was friends with some of the professors there, and they now run the research center at NUS in Singapore. Okay. So we did a lot of collaboration with the universities. So a lot of the work was done kind of in conjunction with universities. So like the Trinidad houses, the things that we're not really making money on, like we did collaborations with the universities, and the idea is we'll, we'll kind of share any profit in the future, but it's more just for the research, it's not for profit at all. Mm -hmm. So that was mainly done through universities. And then I guess um, that's the main way. We've, ha we've, ha we've hired some guys in the past, but it's better just to kind of play with ideas and actually work with the universities. So we work a lot with um, Chinese U and Hong Kong U. So what was the second the second part was about? Second question was um, oh, about the scope of projects. In China, it normally goes through DD because our fees become too expensive for the client. But we've made some really good relationships, like the, the bank project. We're kind of, we're kind of best friends with the LDI. Mm -hmm. So they, they chase down every detail for us. So we've built up these networks over time. Like some of the first buildings came out horrible because once it goes over to another firm, you can't control the details. Mm -hmm. But now we've got some really good relationships and we can control the quality in, in Dubai, it's all done by us, all the, or all the working drawings. Okay, thank you. When, in the beginning, it was all open, like the, the Dalian Library, that was open competition. So in the, in the start, it was all open, but then we started to get invited, there are maybe 10 firms that are invited. So you kind of send in a qualification and get shortlisted. So the water park is an invited competition. And it's, it's just a mix. I mean, the invited are, mu are much safer because you're, you're guaranteed a certain amount of um, payment, so you can generally kind of cover the costs. So for example, we have this guy is an invited competition. So the more our name got out in China, we got more and more invited competitions. But we still do, in Korea, we've done some open competitions. That's how we won the, the LG project, it was an open competition. So for new markets, we do all open competitions, but once we kind of get established, then we started trying to narrow it down to invited competitions. Because there's, there's also, if it's, if it's invited, there's a higher likelihood they're gonna build the project.
I have a question. Um, first of all, thank you very much for sharing. It's uh, amazing the jobs and the works you have done. It's an eye opener for me. Uh, as I see, you are opening in Miami. Yes. And in my mind, I'm wondering why did you choose Miami and what are you seeing in the future that makes it a good spot to open up? Well, we wanted, well, we started in the East and the economy is really, really strong in China. It's actually, the idea is when it's strong, we expand. So when China was strong, we expanded into Dubai and then China had a dip and Dubai covered China. But the idea is to have a kind of a, a global firm and we have to have something in the Americas to make that happen. And also we were, we were bought out by Aegis last year and they have about 400 people in South America. I think they have 50 guys in Martinique and they have guys in Panama and Colombia as well. So for Aegis, they thought the idea of coming west was really good. And they see a lot of potential in the Americas as well. And actually some of our Chinese clients, the, the two jobs I mentioned, they're coming from Chinese clients. They're coming here and building, but they, they don't trust the market but they trust us because they know us from China. So a lot of our Chinese clients are coming with us here. That's, uh... Thank you. Perfect. Yeah, well, it's, they think it. They think it is the front door of South America. But, and we're not. I mean, we're not just gonna work in Florida. I mean, most of our jobs are not coming in Florida right now. I think we've done two jobs in Hong Kong. I think ninety percent of our work is outside of Hong. We always have these offices, and we actually never do work in that city. It's maybe a bit of a curse, but we're finally getting jobs in Hong Kong after ten years. But yeah, the idea is, is it is a gateway to South America. Well, I mean, of course we know that. Yeah, of course. So we are looking at China to uh, yeah, and Malay for Latin American startups. Well, Malaysia too. As soon as I said I was coming, the Malaysian developer tried to hire me and to run his development arm here. They all they all asked me what good properties are. They're all they're all coming and wanting to buy property, and they'll just buy it over the phone. And if it's like if I say it's ten million dollars, they'll be that's too cheap. I can't. That's not going to work out. So yeah, they're all very interested in, they're all a bit gun shy because they I think trust and understanding how different cultures work, it's better if they come through kind of friends. So if we can establish relationships with Tanji and universities, that's a great way to do it. Yes, yeah. So I'm a student from China, and uh, I saw your, a lot of design about of the architecture in China. So uh, sometimes it's it's hard for me to differentiate the architecture in China and from any other architecture. So do you think it is important to 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 integrate the Chinese elements into the architectural design if you are going to build uh, build a building in China? Yeah, um, I mean, we always try to. Let's see, uh, it, it, a lot of it comes from gardens, and then let's see, this one, let's see, like for example, oops, sorry. Yeah, because in China, metaphor and thinking and relating to the culture in the cities is quite important. So for example, like one of the first ones, like the guy on the top, it was a fitness center in Dalian, and that was one of our mistakes, because it, when it went to the LDI, it kind of, it got a bit corrupted, I think, but the idea was, we, we wanted to show that it was a fitness center, but also that it was in China. So the, the pattern's actually based on a muscle, muscle cell and also like a Ming Dynasty pattern. So it's actually combining like a muscle cell with a Chinese pattern and putting the jogging track in between that and the building. And the red color is kind of to highlight this kind of this idea of the tissue. And you can see here, they built it pretty close, but the idea was kind of fusing like a, a traditional pattern with the function. So we, we always try to put some metaphorical piece that ties back to the culture. And I mean, this one was based on some of the silk patterns. This is a stadium, and it was known for kind of embroidery and stitchery. So I guess embroidery and stitchery is not a word, but embroidery. So the idea was there's this metallic coating on top of the metal that at night and different times of day, the, the, this, the, the stitching kind of comes out. So it's kind of about kind of revealing in a subtle way some of the local cultural patterns. 
for each city, we try our best to make it somehow relate to what's happening. I mean, it's difficult at times, but we always try to use a, a metaphor or some kind of historical piece to kind of tie it back to the city. So it's like the one in, in Tongda, we, we did the, the Shangri-La and, and some of the gardens and the flower textures and the kind of musical culture. So we always try to infuse that into the project. And in China, we mainly tie it to making public spaces. I mean, even this one, we actually we violated all the rules across rows and of quite a few things, but we created a space underneath this where people can do the, the kind of daily Tai Chi in an outdoor plaza underneath the space. So we lifted it up, create plazas under the building. We try our best to make it kind of fit within the local context. Thank you. Thanks for coming, guys. Thank you. I hope that was...